I need to introduce this amazing man who's going to come up and speak now. Thomas Mayo is a Kururig Aboriginal in Kukugal, Irubamle, Torres Strait Islander man. He is the National Indigenous Officer of the Maritime Union of Australia. Thomas is a signatory of the uh, Uluru Statement from the heart and has been leading an advocate since its creation in May 2017. He is the chairperson of the Northern Territory Indigenous Labour Network and advises many national organisations. Thomas is the author of four wonder books. Today, Thomas will speak about us, the next generation of Indigenous voices and the role we play in breaking down the barriers for First Nations peoples. We would like to thank First Fire Forever for their contribution to making it possible for Thomas to be here today. Please welcome Thomas Mayer. Thank you, Michael. Kapu um, Goige, everybody. Good morning. Uh, or good day. In my language, Kalalago Ya. Um, I acknowledge country, uh, the traditional owners of this place, and elders past and present. and. Uh, all of our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters here, and kids. Hello, kids. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah so as said, uh, I'm uh, I'm the author of five books now. Actually, uh, my latest book is with Kerry O'Brien, the great ABC journalist, um, called The Voice to Parliament Handbook. All the details you need, um, and uh, and I'm going to talk about the referendum. But I want to do it in a different way than I usually do, given I'm talking about, uh, you know, um, childhood, uh, about how um, we can overcome many of the barriers that we face as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, as Australians. Um, the great challenge that we uh, have because of the truth of the history of this nation, um, the colonisation, the genocide, all of those things that, have, um, that we are yet to deal with. Uh, so I'm going to first read uh, an introduction um, from uh, my proudest work, I think, uh, a book called Dear Son, Letters and Reflections by First Nations Fathers and Sons. Um, and this is the cover here. Uh, and you can see that um, it's a book that has, um, it's through letters. And I opened the book with a letter to my own eldest son, uh, and I conclude it with a letter to my father. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the introduction from this book um, to give you an understanding of uh, just how important um, fatherhood is and breaking through the stereotypes that have uh, come about uh, by uh, this country, demonising Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men um, as part of the tactics to dispossess us, um, to justify all that's been done to our people and how it's so important to, um, to our future to address this. Then I'm going to go into the referendum about a voice to parliament. I'll talk a bit about the Uluru Statement from the heart. I'll talk about the longer history behind the Uluru Statement, the lessons that go into it. Really, I'm going to be talking about also the contemporary history of the Uluru Statement, how it was made. And I want us to understand how we come to this moment in time, where later this year, all of the adults in this room, anyone of voting age, is going to have a choice between saying yes or no. Yes or no to simply recognising Indigenous people for our long connection to this place and our ongoing connection to this place, our heritage and culture, by listening to us when decisions are made about us. Um, I'll conclude with that with the short letter that ends this book, um, a short letter to my father. So I call the introduction to this book, the, the heading is Celebrating First Nations Men, an Act of Defiance. When First Nations men love ourselves, we are better able to love our families and communities Yet loving ourselves is an act of defiance. Since the beginning of the European invasion of our homes on the Australian continent and adjacent islands, 
Colonial institutions have been teaching my people to hate who we are. As a boy in school, I was taught that my forefathers were unintelligent and inhuman, while my white friends were taught that their forefathers were great explorers, builders, inventors, and our saviors. Later, as a young man and the father of three Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander babies, I saw the Racial Discrimination Act suspended by Prime Minister John Howard, putting black families like mine in peril. With blatant discrimination made legal once again, Howard imposed the 2007 Northern Territory Emergency Response, or as others called it, the intervention. As part of the intervention's measures, Aboriginal community leaders were disempowered with all manner of hard fought for rights for self-determination removed. At the border of each of their communities, large signs declared that pornography and alcohol were banned. The Australian Army was mobilised to enforce the emergency measures and the country silently watched on. Child neglect, sub substance abuse and domestic violence were broadcast as Aboriginal problems. Never mind the effects of colonisation and prejudice. Never mind that gender-based violence is prevalent across the entirety of society and as we have learnt, rife in the very parliament where these decisions were made. Indigenous men Australia-wide felt the stare of suspicious eyes, as many people believed that our children needed special protection from their own race, especially from their fathers. These attitudes were all based on lies. And as a middle-aged father of five children, I saw a cartoon in a major newspaper the Australian, that reinforced a negative stereotype about my capacity to be a dad. It depicted an Indigenous man, beer in hand, indifferently facing a police officer who held a black boy by the scruff of the neck. It implied that the man was the father of the boy and because he was Indigenous, and because he was Indigenous, he did not know his son's name, nor did he care for him. The cartoon continued the lessons taught to boys in schools. It reinforced the prejudice against me. Indeed, the cartoon was blatantly racist. Racism is an attitude found in the shallows of the streets and shopping centres through the thick midstream of the Australian media and our workplaces to the dark depths of the decision-making state and federal parliaments. It is against this tide of ignorance that First Nations men defy racism to love and care for ourselves and our families. The letters in this book by sons and fathers for each other are lessons about life and love, about culture and pride, about sexuality and race. Our letters are ultimately a celebration of Indigenous men, though importantly, in a book by men, we have written about the need to end harmful behaviours such as toxic masculinity, coercive control, misogyny and sexism. Men are undoubtedly the main instigators and perpetrators of gender violence. It is our responsibility to call it out amongst us, to never harm women again. Each of the authors has been challenged by writing these letters. Each of us has learnt more about ourselves. Our writing has been healing. With each page we wrote, we Indigenous men have built a vessel. With the strength of our ancestors, we pull the oars of truth against a tide of ignorance and toxic masculinity. And with our words as bright as the stars on a moonless night, we offer our children shining points of guidance. We have done it for our people and our country, for our daughters and mothers, Indigenous girls and women, Indigenous people of all genders. We have done it for our non-Indigenous friends as well. So they may end colonial behaviours and take up an awe of truth with us to go on a voyage to a better future. So that's the introduction to Dear Son. Thank you. So I hope um, you know, that, uh, that helps us think about the importance of gaining a voice, you know, that we should be able to end these stereotypes, that the sort of things that, are, um, that were taught in schools, I know that um, we've come a long way since I was in school, um, but also what the media portrays us as, as Indigenous people, uh, those stereotypes, um, 
And those sorts of racist cartoons that I talked about are still, they still happen. They're still published. Um, articles that um, completely ignore the traumas that we carry from colonization and the failed policies and laws that cause the issues in our communities ultimately, um, they continue to be spread as if this is the reality when it's not. I um, became involved in the campaign way back in 2016. Uh, I was a union official. I used what I learnt on the wharf. I was a wharfie for a long time to about organising, about you know mobilising people, about thinking through how you build structures and how important they are um, to support our own people's struggles on the streets. You might remember in 2015, for example, when Tony Abbott was the prime minister, he cut hundreds of millions of dollars from frontline community services. And when you think about um, the, you know, the, the Peter Dutton, for example, travelling to Alice Springs recently, flying in and flying out, so a great irony to the rhetoric that he was using, flew into Alice Springs, talked about all the youth crime there and everything, and all the problems in that community. But you think back to 2015 and those massive cuts to services for children, you know, with FASD, for those families that were trying to lift their lives, you know, to heal from everything that's been done, um, that has a, a flow-on effect. Um, the reality of, of our, our people's situation, the poverty, um, the social issues, you know, is not a matter of who we are as Indigenous people, as in our culture and our heritage and our, uh, our, our lack of humanity. Um, this is a structural and political problem that we can address. And I'm going to recite the Uluru Statement in a moment, but um, I want you to listen to the words. And, uh, and there's a very poignant part of that statement that really brings that home. That's the Uluru Statement from the heart. I'm just going to talk about the longer history here. Um, we should always start here that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, the First Nations of this country, uh, sovereign nations, continue to be sovereign nations, never ceded our sovereignty. When you look at this map, you can see the hundreds of First Nations, but there's also, this also represents hundreds of unique First Nations languages. And the experts explain that the only way these languages could evolve so uniquely, I'm not talking about different dialects here, I'm talking about unique languages across this continent, the only way that that was possible was that we were masters of dispute resolution. We weren't conquerors of each other's lands. There's a word in the Uluru Statement, you'll hear it when I recite it, it's called makarata. Makarata is a Yolnu word for the coming together after a struggle. It's a word for a dispute resolution process. Our people knew how to make peace. And when you go to those beautiful places in this country and your breath catches at the abundance, you know, the beauty of this place, the peacefulness of it when you're in that quiet moment and you reflect and you think, if you really think about it, what a wonderful life our people would have lived before colonisation came to these shores. Cook himself commented in his journal about you know, what a better life our people had compared to Europeans. You know, the tranquility of the place, and the way that we lived. That's where we should always start. Advanced societies, really. But then in 1901, after colonisation, the frontier wars, you know, as anybody would, we fought to protect country and our families, our dignity and our pride, our traditions. The colonies, that are now the states, New South Wales, Queensland, South Australia, etc. They came together in constitutional dialogues in the late 20th century and negotiated the terms of federation. That's where our constitution comes from in 1901. And I want to point this part of the constitution out. Section 5126 is the race power. And the race power originally excluded Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but Indigenous elders fought to have inclusion in that power because the states were so cruel and they saw the federal government as more benevolent, 
that they were a kinder sort of, you know, and also for bringing uh, gains um, across, this, across the country rather than state by state, back and forth, you know, bringing our country forward uh, in the way that we treated Indigenous people. And so in 1967 we changed that to remove that exclusion from the race power but also to, to remove the discrimination against us being counted in the census. And so the race power is still there. It was important because Queensland particularly was, um, you know, didn't want to end segregational policies and all those sorts of cruel things. Um, and so the federal power helped move that along. But this power, the race power, a lot of Australians are unaware. It's still in our constitution. It's only been made to make special laws about Indigenous people. And in the 1990s there was a court case the high, in the High Court that found, that determined that that power could be used to discriminate to our detriment, not necessarily for our benefit. Okay? So we're seeking a voice, just to jump ahead a bit, we're seeking a voice to be able to influence the use of that power. We don't want to remove it because some beneficial laws are used under that, are made under that power. And uh, that's important, given our status as Indigenous people. So the Uluru Statement is one of many statements and petitions. This one, 1930s, William Cooper and the leaders of the time, a petition to the King. 1963, the Yakala Bark Petitions, a petition to um, the Federal Parliament to protect country, the Yolnu people. You can see that beautiful artwork there about our law, Yolnu peoples. This one here, Larrakia petition to the Queen, 1972. In common for all of these statements and petitions, just like the Uluru Statement from the Heart, they were all dismissed and ignored. Also what was in common, again with the Uluru Statement, they all called for political representation. They all called for a voice, over and over again. This one's a bit different, again beautiful artwork with it. The Barunga Statement, 1988. I separated out because Bob Hawke was the Prime Minister at the time. He bothered to travel to Barunga, small Aboriginal community near Catherine in the Northern Territory, and he promised two things to Aboriginal people. He promised a national treaty, which he couldn't deliver on, he failed. And secondly, he promised a voice, and he established the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission. The Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission to go to another pattern throughout the history of our struggle was silenced. It was John Howard was the opposition leader at the time when this was established. He vehemently opposed it. As soon as he won power, he set about defunding it. It was a service provider, so our people was a tactic of divide and conquer as much as anything else. It caused us to fight over the straps because we were trying to lift our communities. He also amplified its problems. He never celebrated its successes. It was having some good effect. It was doing some good work. And it had problems. But all organisations will have problems from time to time. Universities, unions, corporations, governments. You change the rules, you reform, you adjust. If there's people that are corrupt and criminal, then you deal with that with the law. You close loopholes. Howard amplified the problems to soften up the Australian public and then when he got the Latham Labor opposition support he got rid of it with a stroke of a pen. All those other voices there, similarly, we didn't wait for governments to set them up. Those early ones we made ourselves. But they were silenced through intimidation. They could legally steal our children. They could exile us from country. All those sorts of things. So they silenced those early voices with those powers and those latter ones set up by benevolent governments under Whitlam uh, and, and Hawke and um, these other voices were silenced with a stroke of a pen, a change of policy. As soon as another government comes in, they change the policy, they silence the voice set up under a previous government. So these are lessons that go into the Uluru Statement. So we know for sure, this is a cartoon out of the book with Kerry O'Brien by Kathy Wilcox, always that arrow ends up pointing to hostile. They use Indigenous lives, our matters, as a political football. This one here, the Northern Territory intervention. These are the things that happen when you don't have a voice. If a people don't have a voice, they're easily exploited, they're ignored, they're degraded. 
The intervention was a political move under Howard, and I talked about it in the introduction, but I'll give you one little, one more bit of information. The Liberals, when they, this was just before the 2007 election, there was uh, an expression of disappointment from one of them that they didn't get as much of a boost in the polls as they hoped from doing that. And we know today for a massive amount of taxpayer dollars, it made things worse. So, contemporary history, as the gap was widening, we called for a process to take a question to our people and to the broader Australian public about what we should do next. What form of constitutional recognition should we have? And the dialogues culminated with delegates that were chosen in those dialogues in a convention at Uluru in the heart of the nation. And that is where the Uluru Statement was endorsed with standing acclamation and tears of joy and hope. Now I'm going to recite the Uluru Statement and I hope that you'll feel what we felt in the room that morning. We gathered at the 2017 National Constitutional Convention, coming from all points of the southern sky, make this statement from the heart. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander tribes were the first sovereign nations of the Australian continent and its adjacent islands and possessed it under our own laws and customs. This our ancestors did according to the reckoning of our culture from the creation, according to the common law from time immemorial and according to science more than 60,000 years ago. This sovereignty is a spiritual notion, the ancestral tie between the land or mother nature and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who were born therefrom remain attached thereto and must one day return thither to be united with our ancestors. This link is the basis of the ownership of the soil, or better, of sovereignty. It has never been ceded or extinguished, and it coexists with the sovereignty of the Crown. How could it be otherwise that a people's possessed the land for 60 millennia and this sacred link should disappear from world history in merely the last 200 years? With substantive constitutional change and structural reform, we believe this ancient sovereignty can shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. Proportionately, we are the most incarcerated people on the planet. We are not an innately criminal people. Our children are alien from their families at unprecedented rates. This cannot be because we have no love for them. And our youth languish in detention in obscene numbers. They should be our hope for the future. These dimensions of our crisis tell plainly the structural nature of our problem. This is the torment of our powerlessness. We seek constitutional reform to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country. When we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish, they will walk in two worlds, and their culture will be a gift to their country. We call for the establishment of a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution. Makarata is the culmination of our agenda, the coming together after a struggle. It captures our aspirations for a fair and truthful relationship with the people of Australia and a better future for our children based on justice and self-determination. We seek a Makarata Commission to supervise a process of agreement making between governments and First Nations and truth telling about our history. In 1967, we were counted. In 2017, we seek to be heard. We leave base camp and start our trek across this vast country. We invite you to walk with us in a movement of the Australian people for a better future. Sigilary statement. Thank you. And so there it is. Uh, I hope you're all familiar with it. Um, look, it was important to cover that history behind this because those that are opposing this referendum, the No campaign is trying to say that this is Albo's idea, that this is an ALP idea, that this is a Canberra voice. That's rubbish. It's a history behind this that we have learnt from, that has shaped this proposal. The work was done through all of that time 
And then we did the hard work to come to a consensus at Uluru and to take it to the Australian people. Now, we knew that this would be dismissed like all those other ones because of what's happened before. And we wrote this to the Australian people. I want to acknowledge Professor Megan Davis, uh, Amaru niece here and uh, some of your family. Um, the, one of the great architects of this um, shaped the process um, with all of her expertise as a public law expert. Um, important work was done. You can see the names there of all of us. Painted at Uluru, you can see that's in Mutajulu, the community close to Uluru. Anagu woman, the Rini Kulitsu, the lead artist there, on the second from your right. Uh, and took it, I was part of taking around the country with many others, um, building this people's movement. Now I just want to, before I conclude, I want to talk about this moment a bit more. This referendum was committed to by um, the Albanese government in the election campaign. It's a promise that they made to hold the referendum in this term of parliament. It just passed through parliament uh, last week, I think, or earlier this week, Monday. On Monday it passed through parliament, so we're on our way. The date of the referendum hasn't been announced yet, uh, but I believe it'll be mid-October. So this is urgent. We're only about 16 weeks away from this. So this is an urgent talk that I'm giving you. It's not just about history or culture. This is an urgent call to action. Referendums are hard to win. We need a majority of Australians and a majority of Australians in a majority of states, four out of six. So we must win Queensland. We must work hard uh, in this region to win. And the most successful was 67, 91.8. <coughs> Um, to be honest, I don't think we're going to get those numbers because the opposition is pretty fierce and shameless. Um, Peter Dutton and the coalition have taken a position against it. We don't have bipartisan support. So if we win this, we're going to have to work hard for every single vote and we're going to make history when we win because it'll be the first referendum won without bipartisan support and that is a motivator as well. This is the question we'll be asked. It's a simple question, and it simply should be yes. A proposed law to alter the Constitution to recognise the first peoples of Australia by establishing an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice, do you approve this proposed alteration? Yes. Yes. And if we approve it, these are the words that will go into the Constitution. A new chapter nine, section 129, in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of Australia, one, there shall be a body to be called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice. Two, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice may make representations to the Parliament and Executive Government of the Commonwealth on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And three, the Parliament shall, subject to the Constitution, have power to make laws with respect to matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice, including its composition, functions, powers and procedures. Now that first bit is in recognition that we're here. It's recognising our existence, okay? That we continue to be here. The second part establishes that there will always be a voice. That the next government, and you can imagine what Dutton would do with this if um, he won power, if it was only legislated, it puts it out of the reach of hostile governments. It ensures that there will always be a voice for our people, a representative body. Secondly, it may make representation, so it guarantees that to the executive government as they shape policies and laws and the parliament as they pass them, okay? And it is on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And the parliament decides the rest, the model, okay? We're not gonna put that there's 24 representatives or make a decision about that now because then people start fighting over if it should be 25 or 26 and it distracts from what we're saying yes or no to here, which is simply establishing a voice in recognition of indigenous people to make representations. Those are the guarantees that we are saying yes to. And there's design principles. I encourage you to look them up, but here's just some of them. It gives more shape to the voice because there is a genuine hunger to understand this, you know, as voters. Um, things like it won't have a right to veto. It won't deliver services like ATSIC did because there's indigenous controlled organizations. It will work along existing organizations and traditional structures. 
um, it will be chosen by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people based on the wishes of our community. So after the referendum, consultation happens with communities to shape the model. The legislation is then in, uh, put in place that gives how many reps and all the rest. But we're only voting on recognition and a voice to have a say. Simple. Okay? All right. The campaign, yes23.com.au. Uh, get on there, register, support it. Um, there's also an Uluru Dialogue campaign, ulurustatement.org.au. Um, and there's a Kitchen Tables Conversation campaign, um, togetheryes.com.au. So please get on there, volunteer, uh, register your support, donate, do everything that you can. So I'm getting the, the wave there. I need to conclude. I'm just going to finish with this letter to my father. But before I do, I just want to say, don't waste this opportunity, eh? Do the hard work that we did to bring this opportunity about. 16 weeks, thereabouts. Have conversations with everybody that you can think of. Write them down. Systematically work through them. Have an initial conversation. Be respectful. Don't expect to move them straight away if they're against it. But revisit it. Okay? And get on board with the official campaign. Dear Dad, when I announced I would become a writer, you said you wouldn't read my books. I wasn't hurt. Instead, I was emboldened. You have always demanded that I mustn't talk about you to anyone, how you have managed to survive and provide. But here in this letter, Dad, your modesty will be outdone by my pride. And why shouldn't a son be proud of his father? You have overcome so much. You came from Thursday Island in apartheid Queensland as a young man with nothing. You built a home with your own hands, even though you didn't have any qualifications as a builder. You and mum did this on one meagre income, using aptitude, commitment, and ultimately your love for your children. You taught me to hunt and fish on the reefs and to cook as Torres Strait Islander men do. You taught me good values and discipline. You taught me to always work hard. I have learnt that although your quick temper felt harsh, from your perspective, being hard on me was necessary. You were preparing me for a world that would not love me like you do. You figured that a foot up the backside at home was better than me putting a foot wrong outside where making a poor decision could land me in prison or perhaps six foot under the ground. I have idolised you and, with age, I have learnt to follow where you shine the light without walking in your shadows. I am educated, patient and generous because of you. I am imperfect like you. And with as many of your lessons as I could gather, I have written a letter to your grandson, a letter to teach him how to be a better dad than we were. And how good would that be? For we are Indigenous fathers and we care for our children. We have loved, nurtured and provided for them. We've protected them and taught them how to survive and be proud of their culture. We have done as your father did and his father and so on for generations that go back tens of thousands of years. We were the first builders, craftsmen, storytellers, artists, fishermen, hunters, scientists, inventors, explorers, farmers, engineers, warriors and healers. We were not conquerors of each other's lands. We did not strangle Mother Earth. We were her protectors. We are still all of these things and so much more. We are a continuum of proud Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men, the fathers of the longest surviving culture on earth. And now, Dad, as your hard exterior becomes brittle with age, I feel you. As dusk reaches your eyes, eyes that were too bright to look upon in my youth, I see you. I understand you, Dad. I love you. I'll always be your dear son, Thomas. Thank you. Let's start to give this medal to you. Thank you. <laughs>